Hi, good morning. Welcome to the EE Colloquium series. Today I'm really pleased to uh, introduce Roger Quinn. Roger's professor at uh, Case Western Reserve University. He directs their biorobotics lab. Uh, he has actually directed the biorobotics laboratory there since 1990. Roger got his, uh, his uh, PhD from Virginia Tech, 1985. And he's worked with a number of biologists, including Roy Ritzman, Hilla Chill, and Mark Willis, on biologically inspired robots. Uh, and the neat thing is his robots are really cool, especially the one that cuts your lawn for you. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome my former colleague from Case Western, Roger Quinn. Thanks, Ari. So right, uh, we've been doing biorobotics for a long time. Um, uh, locomotion, uh, mostly legged locomotion, uh, based on animals, of course. Uh, I'll be giving you um, a smattering of work we've done over the last 20-some years. Uh, I apologize for not talking about other people's work, which has influenced ours. Uh, just about every slide here has multiple papers uh, associated with it, in which we've been very careful to do our best to, to uh, give credit where credit's due. Um, so that being said, I'm just going to go through and show you lots of things with lots of videos. So the, our, our concept of the biorobotics research process in terms of uh, locomotion is uh, learning, from bio le learning biological principles from animals and then applying those principles to uh, improve robot mo mobility and autonomy. And then, then possibly use those robots as models to test hypotheses about you know, how animals move. And then that helps us to learn more biological principles and it's a circular process. Here is my, uh, one of my biology colleagues, Roy Ritzman. And these are experiments he's done, typical type of experiments and behavior. You see the uh, cockroach and the, uh, this one is just scampering up a, uh, a, a steel plate. He's going vertically up a steel, steel plate. This one's climbing mm -hmm. over a styrofoam uh, block. And this one is climbing a block there. And what you find is uh, the animals don't just smash into the blocks unless they're trying to escape from something. They actually, this cockroach comes toward the block, rears up before it gets to the block because it senses the block with its antennae and its eyes, and it can rear up before and then climb over elegantly rather than smashing into it and mechanically going over. Uh, this, this video shows how nice the, uh, well, we'll get back to that. So why do we need robots uh, with uh, animal-like mobility and autonomy? Clearly, um, clearly we do. If you go back to 1990, uh, whole crews of reviewed mechanisms that coordinate gates and insects. Uh, decades of uh, research went into this paper, these papers that, uh, that were published about this time. Because this is the left front leg, the right front leg, left middle, right middle, left back, right back. Um, here are mechanisms. Uh, step, here's a negative step, a positive impulse, a ramp. Those three mechanisms, one, two, and three, are what's in this network. So mechanisms two and three go back and forth between the front legs. And then you have mechanisms ipsilateral over here, forward and backward. These are, these are mechanisms that they figured out based on behavior of stick insects. And what those mechanisms do is change what's called the posterior extreme position of the leg. So when the foot gets back to the posterior extreme position in stance, it then reaches forward and goes into swing. So now that's how you can coordinate legs, by just changing the posterior extreme position of adjacent legs based on this network. And it works really well. Here is uh, what we call robot two, our second robot. And you see here it's uh, three legs are on a board. We pull the board away. This is all autonomous, and it uh, steps autonomously. So that's just um, sort of passive type behavior. Uh, here's a wave gate, uh, back, middle, front, back, middle, front on the other side, back, middle, front on this side again. That's a wave gate. Here's a tripod gate. Three legs moving at a time. It's an alternating tripod gate. 
And you could do gates in between these. There's a whole continuum of gates. You could do it based on that network you just saw. Here it is, yawing in place. So it's just yawing in place, and now it's going, once it gets turned 90 degrees, it'll crab sideways. And this is, again, using those same mechanisms, but in a, in a, in a clever way. Here, watch this, watch this front middle foot here. There we go. It hit, and when it came forward, it hit, and then reached over. That's the elevator reflex that you find in animals. And, and here, watch this foot as it's searching. It's going to miss, and then search, search, search. That's the searching reflex. All this animal has, all this robot has is uh, load feedback on its uh, legs. It has no eyes, no antennae. So it could feel its way across, forward and backward across this slatted surface. So this control system is a distributed control system inspired by insect behaviors. It's, uh, you see it has compliance, uh, both active and passive, in the legs. It's got stepping reflex. It's got those gates you just saw, that network you just saw. Uh, it's got the elevator reflex and searching reflex all built into it. If you look at an actual cockroach leg, it's much more complicated than that one. Here's the uh, thorax coxa joint here. There's three degrees of freedom there. There's one here, the coxa trochanter, another trochanter femur, and then another femur tibia. The, f the whole ankle and foot is a whole really interesting thing. It's got passive mechanisms here. So both this way and this way, it's all passive, except it's just like a cat's claw. There's one muscle that pulls and catches the claw. Just like a cat, it can't doesn't have a muscle to do this. That's passive. So if you have a, if you have a cat, you know, the cat's claws can to, can to get stuck in you. They can do this, but they can't do this. So it's just the same thing with, the, with the, uh, the cockroach. So the kind of experiments that Roy used to do, a lot of, he still does some, but here's how we learned how the, uh, the cockroach moves its joints. He can do high-speed video of an animal, in this case, it's, it's walking a glass uh, greased plate, so it, the feet slip. It's, it's supported here, so it can't go anywhere. And then you can record high-speed video, at the same time record uh, muscle activity. So then, uh, here, here's the EMGs, here's uh, joint angles at the same time. They've now gotten to the point where they can actually record all six legs, all the joints of all six legs, all at the same time, all three-dimensionally. and. They can also record from uh, EMGs at the same time, but not all of them. So here's uh, what we call Robot 3, also based on cockroach. If you look at it from the side, it looks a lot like a cockroach. The front legs are relatively small, but they have, they're more like arms. There are five joints that are, are important. The middle legs, we can cut it down to four joints, even though there's more than that. Uh, you can cut it down to four. And the rear legs, it's more like just three that's really necessary. They act more like pistons. You see this is a big, strong robot. You saw Gabe here. First off, Rich built this robot. Gabe did the control work for it. And you saw Gabe beating on the side of the robot, showing it's got active. It's a, the control system is, uh, gives it a great deal of stability, right? And he's proving that by pushing on it. Well, Gabe is now employed at Boston Dynamics, and he's still at it beating up on robots. Um, I'm sure you've all seen this video. There we go. So he's still beating up on robots. Uh, so Gabe left our lab and uh, went to work at Boston Dynamics, and now he heads the uh, controls group. So he's responsible for all the crazy stuff you see, um, all the robots. The, the biped now that they're working with, uh, if you look at uh, their website, you can find lots of uh, videos. So, this robot, on the other hand, instead of being, uh, having active control to give it stability, has artificial muscles. These are festo artificial muscles, or air muscles, revertuators, McKibbins, whatever you want to call them. Um, bottom line is there's no active control at this point. We're being on it with a stick a bit here and showing that uh, you get the springiness from the, uh, the muscle property. Now, we're talking about two paths of biological observation. What you just saw there was uh, looking at the animal and getting, making uh, models more and more like the cockroach. There's another way to go, and that is functional. 
Just functionally, what do you want? What do you want in a robot? Well, if you want to make a cockroach, a, a robot that, that uh, moves like a cockroach, first thing you notice, they typically run in a triflight gate. Second, they change their gates when they do things like climb. They change the gates based on the, uh, uh, in the environment. So here's a case where you see these two legs are actually on the block. These two legs are back here pushing the, the, uh, the uh, cockroach over the block. Clearly, it's not on a triplet gate anymore. Another thing you find is that the cockroach sees, it feels a, uh, the block ahead of it and actually rears up before it gets there instead of smashing into it. And the other thing it does is watch this joint right here. The cockroach has a body flexion joint right there, which is important. So it can bend forward and reach with its arms and grab for climbing. So it would be nice to have a body joint like that that allows it to keep it from high centering here that would otherwise do. In fact, Roy did this evil experiment where he actually put a, uh, uh, a toothpick here, glued it on the back of the body so the, uh, it, couldn't, it could bend its body. Had a lot harder time getting over this out, so I had to reach further and really struggle. All right. So here comes the concept of the wheel egg. We know what wheels are good for. Um, you have good roads your car feels really good driving on them, right? Bumpy roads, it's kind of annoying. Um, if you have really discontinuous terrain, like uh, running across, you know, bowlers across a stream, uh, legs are great. Wheels would not be so good. Here's the idea of the wheel leg. It's, it rolls like a wheel, but can climb like a leg. It's, uh, you can get the leg cycle function with constant motor speed. Wheel legs are not new. Uh, here's a 1954 patent. If you look at it, it's got, it's got wheel legs. I was, it was pointed out by Barry Trimmer that uh, the flag of the Isle of Man actually looks like a wheel leg. <laughs> three, three legs put together in a wheel leg. I'm also told that uh, the ancient Romans had wheelbarrows with wheel legs on them because they had all those steps all over the hills of, of Rome. And it makes sense to put a wheel leg on there I haven't seen this, I'm told. Okay, so we made a robot with six wheel legs. And there you see it moving at a tripod gate. It only needs one propulsion motor instead of that robot three had five, four, three, let's see, what was that? A nine, 12, 24 motors, essentially. They were air cylinders, but we had 29, uh, I'm sorry, 24 on them, right? This has one, this has one. So with one electric motor, we can run, have a robot that runs very nicely in a tri by gate. But the thing is, if you only have one motor, how do you change gates? You could either put a bunch more motors on, or you could put torsional mechanisms at each axle. So now the motor's driving the inner axle, but between the inner axle and the outer axle, you have this torsional mechanism. So every wheel leg can turn relative to the inner axle or in, independent of the motor. So here you see, still only one motor, but it has these torsional mechanisms. If you watch this over and over again, you see that the gate actually adapts to the terrain. Watch those front legs. It's not a tripod gate anymore. Watch the front legs right here when it hits there. They actually come into phase and then climb. And that's Purely mechanical control, no active control whatsoever. The next thing you want to do is put a body joint into it so you can actually rear up before the box. Unfortunately, uh, the, the person driving this uh, robot isn't doing the rearing up before the box, but, it, but he can because there is another motor there for the body joint. And you can also avoid the, uh, um, you can also avoid the high centering by rotating the body down and actually having the, the body follow the terrain. So with those simple mechanisms, we have a robot that behaves a lot like a cockroach, even though it has no, none of this active control stuff, all this wacky active control stuff that people like to do. So yes, this is remote control. I'll get to autonomous uh, behavior later. But how do you steer? Here's what we do. Front legs, rear legs. Do this and you turn, turn right. Do this and you turn left. So we steer 
the front uh, wheel legs and the rear wheel legs independently. Actually, they're not independent. We actually tie them together electrically. They both have a small servo motor, and we just tie them together electri electrically so that they're not even independent. So that's how we turn, two small servos. So we have one large motor for propulsion, one smaller motor for body joint, and two s little servos. And you can actually then send it out in the field. Here's, a, here's an a orange orchard in California running around. One of the things you worry about when you have continuous rotation of things like uh, wheel legs is things getting stuck in the wheel legs. Well, you'll see here, we purposely drive it over branches, uh, steel bars, things that uh, you would think it's, would say, there's, a, there's a branch. It doesn't get stuck. There's another one. You think, oh, oh you think it was going to get stuck, but it didn't. It's gone. So the point, oh, it's dragging something along there, but it'll fall out. The reason it doesn't get stuck is because, again, those torsional mechanisms allow the variation of the wheel legs. So that means you can actually uh, release. So anyway, that, it'll just keep going. Um, here's my favorite video, probably, of, uh, of one of these. We call them WEGS robots, of course. Wheels plus legs equals WEGS. That's the idea. Here is a, uh, a WEGS robot. Uh, climbing a rubble pile. And you see it, you, anyway, it's a big rubble pile. Those are big, nasty chunks of concrete and rocks and things. And you'd think it would get stuck. You would think things would go wrong. But it just keeps going. The reason it keeps going is, number one, um, clever mechanisms. But number two, y y there's, a remote con there's a person driving it who's smart enough to know when it gets hung up on a boulder to use the body joint. So you can l raise up the middle legs for example, or raise up the front legs, whichever happens to be stuck. So it's possible to sort of wiggle your way around and climb rubble piles. I'm not saying this thing doesn't get stuck. It can. It can definitely get stuck. But, about it, but it's uh, considering the simplicity of it, it's uh, pretty capable. OK. So we've done a lot with these uh, Wiggs robots. Uh, here's Alex Boxerbaum. Here's his robot. It's got sunglasses on, taking a drive with him in his car. It's about a meter long. And this is just uh, some initial stuff that you uh, wouldn't be surprised. It runs around, runs around in the snow, runs up hills. It's all good. Um, this is more interesting. Well, here's, here it's going up steps, which are, this is pretty straightforward for it. Notice if someone staying there on wheels, holding the door open, which is ironic. <laughs> so here it is showing its uh, turning center. I mean, it's a uh, turning radius. It's pretty good. OK, here's the uh, body joint. There's a motor here. There's a motor right there, a transmission. And right here is a worm gear. And now you turn the worm gear, and you turn the sprocket, and that's what drives the body joint. So it's an active body joint, right? But what's exciting about this is that Alex figured out how to make the body joint compliant. He's got bevel washers here and here to act like stiff springs. So that means that when, OK, so he's, he's now going to show you that, yes, it's got compliance. And we're not back driving that motor when we do that. That means we can use a small motor, a big transmission that can't ba be back driven, yet the compliance keeps the transmission from getting broken. All our other robots we built, eventually we broke the transmission. In fact, you know, there's, there's an amusing story about that, but I can tell you later if you're interested. So here comes Mr. Pillow to save the day. That robot was not using its body joint. Now he's using his body joint. And he can climb remarkably tall things, taller than the diameter of the wheel legs, significantly taller than the diameter of the wheel legs. Um, this, of course, is remote control. A uh, person who knows what he's doing with that remote control. But you see the strategy. The whole idea is to get that center of mass over that, that lip. Now he's going to lower that front of the body and get a good purchase with the middle legs. And uh, up we go. All right. Of course, we've. Uh, we built lunar waves and, of course, sent them to a Mars yard. We didn't have a lunar yard to send them to. 
So it turns out if you took one of that robot, if you took one of those robots you just saw, put him in the loose sand, he'd burrow like a worm. So instead of doing that, it would be nice to run on top of the sand. So we made these concave feet. Put the concave feet on him, and off he goes. Okay. Darn it. Oh, well. Anyway, you put the concave feet on him, and off he goes in loose sand. Works just fine. Uh, for search and rescue, uh, the, the idea is to have a really small robot, lightweight robot. So there, there it is. It can run around on tracks. This I can't take credit for. This is Geosystems uh, zipper mast. It can raise up in the air eight feet, so you can put cameras and lights on it. So what's good about that is um, for search and rescue, you can get in tight spaces, and then you can go in and then look from a person's perspective. Um, so that, like I say, it's Geosystems zipper mast. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. Think of uh, a, a three-dimensional zipper is what it is. Three pieces of coil unwrapping, coming together, and interlocking just like a, a zipper. Uh, and he's just showing off now. So anyway, um, the other innovation we did here is sometimes tracks just aren't enough. Um, and yes, it'd be nice you could, go, you could do what uh, iRobot does with the uh, multiple uh, fli you know, the flippers and tracks, but that makes the robot bigger. What you can do instead is you can put wheel legs on it, and you can quick, these are quick change releases, so you can slap on the wheel legs, tap them off, and they're made out of carbon fiber, so they don't weigh much at all, uh, very little inertia. And we also made it more compact by making the, putting the torsional springs inside the hubs. So a search and rescue person could take this robot and choose tracks or, or, or wheel legs and you know, drop it down with a rope or whatever where it wants to go, which is what they typically have to do. Okay, okay so amphibious wigs. We, have, of course, have to do this. Um, we call it Sea Dog. Um, so you, you get the idea. We also call it Pelican Wigs because it's inside a Pelican case for, uh, for sealing it. I mean, that was an obvious thing to do, right? You want to seal a robot, you build it inside a pelican case, you drill a f the, the minimum number of holes through for axles and things, and you seal those up, and you've got pelican wigs, otherwise known as sea dog. And this should be a video of it in its first, yeah, there we go. This is uh, not even completely done. Notice it has a tail, two tails, actually. And, um, this is amusing. It's raining off into the lagoon. Uh, Howard will know this lagoon. <laughs> off into the lagoon. The amusing thing, of course, is the robot wasn't done yet. We had to get a video real quick. It's not completely sealed up, so this rover, robot is taking on water rapidly. <laughs> it comes out and it starts draining. And uh, we quickly shut it off before things short out. But the bottom line is we got a video. <laughs> yes, the legs work. I mean, the, the tail works. It turns out you, those, that tail, we actually, I don't have that video, but you can actually climb things remarkably well with four wheel legs and a tail. You can climb just as well as that other robot climbed in terms of the tall obstacles. All right, now, a little bit of history. Here is a robot called Prolero. One leg per, I'm sorry, one motor per leg. And you see what it does. It's perfectly fine for exploring Mars. That was the concept. Very simple robot for, for exploring Mars. They claim no bio-inspiration. You see what, it, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. Because it's got one motor per leg, it can turn, it, it can do various, you know, it could do gates if it wanted to. Rex, absolutely fantastic. You see what it's doing? The design isn't any different than Prolero. It's got one motor per leg, and each leg is just a spoke that goes around in a circle. But, they, it, the body doesn't flop on the ground. See that? It goes through stance it, slowly and then rapidly through swing so it can come back and catch itself again. So it can go back into stance again. It's, uh, and then you can do different gates because you've got six motors, you do different gates and, and they, you make the, uh, the legs kind of springy and that's why it kind of bounces around like that. So that has six, six motors, six big motors and um, the gates very uh, actively. The difference with WEGS is it's only got one big motor, and uh, therefore it's relatively lightweight, and it can do cool things like wheelies. 
It's a high performance. And it gates very passively rather than actively. All right, so the other thing you can do uh, with, with WEGS is make them really small because there's only one propulsion motor. And this is the quadruped. This is just going at, showing it, uh, kind of running over things, running at 10 by lengths per second, running around outside in the grass, hiding in the white line. It's a remote control, though, so it can go downstairs really well. <laughs> it's not hard. To go upstairs, on the other hand, Roy found this. Roy Ritzman found this, this animal. It's a click beetle. He recognized for what, for what it was. He did the high-speed video. It uses its body to snap itself up in the air. It actually jumps in the air by snapping its body. So we came, the idea based on that is why use the legs to jump? Because we were trying to figure out how do we make our legs jump on a Wegg's robot, and that'd be a pain in the neck. So we thought, well, let's use a different mechanism. Click people does it. Why, not? why shouldn't we? <laughs> so that's the way to get upstairs. Um, we always want to make a, a long segmented, you know, a, a long segmented uh, Wegg's robot. So this one has one motor per segment, and it turns and it climbs. Oh, I got to have video. I got to have sound for this. Wait a minute. This is just so much fun to hear. Yeah. There's not much noise on the carpet, but it's turning. There we go. It's got just one, uh, one motor for, turn, you know, for pulling on the right, one motor for turning on the left. Think of it as having a spine. It's like having a spine, right? So, and you can um, also pull on tendons to, to make it uh, raise its body, uh, lower its body for climbing. So yeah, Nicole had this, this idea to do this because she did a, you'll see later, she did a uh, back race for a human, uh, for a paraplegic. And then she thought, why not do a robot? And uh, anyway, I love it. So, all right. So, of course, we had to make it fly also because, you know, why not? So, Some animals benefit from the yoga you see, um, we put wheel legs on the front of a, a micro air vehicle. It's just a fixed wing micro air vehicle, a 12 inch wingspan here. And the other cool thing was uh, foldable wings so it could go through a tight space. This is work with Peter Ifu at University of Florida, who's, uh, who's the man when it comes to micro air vehicles with fixed wings. And over here, you see a camera, uh, the, the robot's view of the world as it was flying around. Again, that was remote control. And this is showing the, uh, the yeah, we use mini wakes. But uh, so there you, have, you see it's crawling around. And there it crawls off of a roof, takes to the air, can fly around. Now it's looking from the ground at that same sequence you saw earlier where it was uh, coming in for a landing. They're kind of rough landings. It takes a really good pilot to not have a horrible landing uh, when the aircraft's this small. But you see it was successful. It can still walk. So we call it MAL for micro air and land vehicle. We have done uh, autonomous uh, uh, flight. Uh, with GPS and a microcontroller. So flying these things, like I said, is a real pain in the neck. You have to, you have to be a really good pilot to fly them. But even I can fly the one that's, uh, that has the microcontroller on it because all you have to do is toss it <laughs> and give it some GPS waypoints, and off it goes. Okay, of course, you also want to make these robots climb. Um, uh, Keller Autumn, uh, Bob Full, th that group, uh, they They've been working with gecko climbing since uh, their uh, famous paper from 2000 in, in Nature. Uh, the fellow that works with, uh, did a lot of work with, uh, he actually wrote the book on insect attachment devices is Stanislav Gorb. Uh, he worked with us, and, and the idea is that Van der Waals forces, we have very tiny hairs on your feet, nano-sized nano hairs on your feet. That's the concept. Uh, Stas helped engineer uh, this green material, which has, it, it's a hairy pad, so it's like a dry adhesive. It's not nano size, it's not nearly small enough, but you can get pretty good grip with it. And this gives you the idea that cockroach on the left, wegs, a uh, mini wegs on the right, this is using scotch tape. You know scotch tape, you've got to peel it carefully so it doesn't break, right, or just get you stuck. So the trick was kinematically getting this right so the foot comes down plants, you get a good grip, 
and then when you, then you peel off. So we get the same type of motion the cockroach uses to peel its feet off, to atta both attach and peel its feet. And here you see, yes, here you see a gecko next to a mini legs, roughly the same size, um, similar weight. And here you see the first vertical climbing of a robot with a dry adhesive. This is a number of years ago. Uh, here's a, uh, the same robot with scotch tape. It lost a foot. It was inverted. It lost a foot and kept going. Scotch tape is better in terms of its stickiness than this particular dry adhesive, but uh, scotch tape gets dirty quickly. This stuff, even if it gets dirty, you can wash it and just keep reusing it. So the idea of dry adhesive, you know, like gecko feet, is, uh, is it's a really good one. This was the first edition uh, of, of the first prototype and the first successful, here we go again, uh, climbing a vertical surface, just barely. Look at the hand, keep coming in there just in case, right? So this was uh, the first time it actually worked. And since then, a lot of groups have been successful with other types of robots and much better dry adhesives. And it is a field that is, uh, the technology is, is greatly improving. There you go. Okay, now we move on to uh, what we call DigBot. Dig is for distributed inward gripping. What they know from geckos and, and insects, climbing animals, what they do is they attach either with their claws, in this case it's claws on a screen, but if you have uh, sticky pads, whatever, you attach on one side of the body, attach on the other side of the body with another leg, pull inward. If you do that, you get a good grip. The inward gripping is very important. So that's what we're using here to be successful. Uh, this robot can climb it, it, on the screen independent of the direction of gravity, as you saw, inverted, um, vertical, whatever. This robot did not work well at all initially because what it was lacking was cockroach-like feet and ankles. I told you before, cockroach ankles are compliant two-dimensionally. I mean, both this way, both this way and this way. So if you just put claws on this, it was not very successful at all. By putting the passive compliance into the ankle, it became uh, really good uh, at uh, doing this without falling off the screen. So yeah, the uh, mimicking this compliance that you find in here was essential. And we're also, of course, mimicking the claw. Okay, now on to, uh, now on to the worm. Um, okay, so years ago, we, we started making these multi-segmented uh, peristaltic motion uh, worm-like devices. Um, we make three, four, five segments. And they're incredibly slow. Everybody who's done this finds out that they're incredibly slow because they move forward a bit, come back 50%. Move forward a bit, come back 50%. And you wonder, why is this? And when you look at it, you figure out what's going on because you don't have enough segments. If you look at a worm, it's got 150 segments. It's much more efficient. More segments, the better. So Alex Boxerbaum came up with the idea, throughout the segment idea, make it continuous. Make it completely continuous. Make it hollow. If it's hollow, fluid can throw, flow through it. So now we can uh, go into water lines, you know, oil gas pipelines, do inspections as flow goes through it. Also as an endoscope. Also, you know, for colons and, and small intestines. And if you make it small enough, bloodstreams. So by making it continuous, having a continuous wave, we made it faster than earthworms. Western Reserve University okay, has we're developed stop several that innovative sound. designs for a new kind of Okay. Okay, so there we have the concept. This is when we first thought we were thinking of using shape memory alloys. Uh, maybe for small robots, that would still be a good idea. This is just showing simulations. Okay, so there's the design. Uh, bicycle cables. We didn't have much funding. Bicycle cables, one motor in the back, driving a cam. The cam pulls on cables. 
the cables come up. For example, a cable comes up here, heads off around the robot, and you'll see it in a moment. There, there's a circumferential cable right there, right? But it doesn't end there. It comes back, as you'll see in a moment. The blue comes back here, comes back here, and down around this cam. So as that motor, if I can stop it, that stop, stop. Okay, there. That gives you the idea of how this thing works. This cable originates up here, goes around here, comes back, and the blue line comes here. As this, as this uh, cam goes around, right now that cable is pulled. Therefore, it, the circumferential muscle is pulling in, and that's creating the wave. And because this motor goes around, the cam goes around, you, the cables that are being pulled, you start at the front and you work your way back. So you're causing a wave to flow from front to back continuously. The red is a longitudinal actuator, so you can turn. All right, so that's basically how it works. And here we, get, we uh, plug in the battery and off it goes. You see the cam going round and round, and you see the wave start at the front and work its way back. There's actually two waves. So you, you, can, you can establish one, two, three waves. And this robot, the two waves seem to work the best. And that is actually uh, scaled um, in terms of body lengths per, 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 uh, per minute. Faster than the earthworm, and, and that's simply because the earthworm has segments and this is continuous. Oh, darn it. There we go. Okay. So, you can also use, as I said before, you can also use robots as models for animal studies. And this goes to, um, there's a, this, this work caught our eye. It's, uh, they, I told you before, that, uh, behavioral studies, they found the network that coordinates gates in insects from behavioral studies. Since that time, this is 14 years later, lots more work with sick insects, neurobiology. They actually discovered the neurobiological circuit that controls the, the movement of, of an insect leg. Actually have the circuit. And that was fantastic. Um, okay, what they find? First off, every joint has its own CPG. A CPG is a central pattern generator. Every joint has its own CPG. The CPGs are not connected in any way. So each controller is independent. But they share sensory information. The, the sensory information coming in from the leg goes to the different joint controllers, and that's what coordinates a leg. So we've been working with, these, with uh, University of Cologne because of this. And here's a robot leg that uh, we developed. It's a, it's a model of a stick insect leg. And the point is, it's running that, that network that they discovered. It's a finite state machine uh, implementation of the network. But you can see it works very nicely. And what's nice is that. Uh, with a nice user interface, you can change, like here we go, you can change a connection weight in the network and you get different behavior. So you can actually do experiments on the leg that you couldn't do on the uh, actual animal. And here you see uh, disturbing the, uh, the experiment, it's, uh, it's robust to, oh, Maybe not. Look, it gets stuck. It gets stuck. The reason it gets stuck, this leg can get stuck, is because it's sensory driven. It has no real CPGs in it. it and when it gets stuck, it's sitting there waiting for a sensory event that never happens. If it never happens, it's stuck, right? So it needs some kind of, you can just arbitrarily put a timer in to solve that problem. But if you actually built a neurobiological circuit correctly, with real CPGs, you can solve the problem. So here's Roy again, and here's the, uh, the basic idea of a, uh, the uh, central nervous system of, uh, of an insect. What you have up there is a command formation place, so it's a central <coughs> complex, it's the, it's the brain. And then, uh, of course, you have information descending, uh, commands descending, and uh, sensory information ascending. But they go through the subesophageal ganglion right here, through these neck connectives. The subesophageal ganglion is kind of like your brainstem. 
The, th the thoracic ganglia is kind of like your spinal cord. Very similar. Very similar architecture. Turns out you can do that to an insect, cut the con neck connectors right there. So if you do that, you turn the cockroach into a zombie. It walks and walks and walks and walks until it dies. The other thing, some things it doesn't do very well, even though it walks in a charlie blood gate, and t you know, forever basically, um, there are things it can't do very well, and that is adjust its body posture. So the point is, that brain actually is important. It actually does something, even in, you know, even in locomotion. So here you see the intact animal is going to be, be able to walk up this 45 degree incline very nicely. The other one's not going to do as well. And unfortunately, there is no Mr. Pillow. Roy's mean. Yep. Oh, well. See, if it was me, I would have put a pillow there for him. Okay, so here's the idea. Uh, legs moving forward, forward walking, descending command, sends some information down, causes turning. That's the idea. Makes sense. Roy tells us, you know, if you suggest to Roy that this is how it works, there's one circuit for running, there's another circuit for climbing, another circuit for turning, and all these other things. So you just keep, you make different circuits and you put them in there, and all that's happening is you send the commands, do the switching. Roy said, screams, no, this is not the way it works. Roy will scream at you, by the way, right, Howard? Yeah. So here's the way it really works. You have one system here, one system here that does everything, and there's not switching, it's just modulating, slight modulation, slight, slight twisting of knobs. And that causes the difference between running, turning, uh, climbing, whatever. That's the way it really works. For example, that network I was talking about from uh, that they discovered at, uh, in Germany, these red things are different than these red things. The gray things in both pictures are the same. The red things are different. The red connections, the pathways are different. This one does forward stepping. This one does inside turning. So you see most of the connections are the same, but you do have to make some changes. And if you do that, you can show that normal, here's normal walking forward, You'd make a sudden change to, to turning, and now there's a transition, and then you've got inside turning. This is just joint angles uh, in, a, in a robot experiment. This is using the robot leg. That's great. The thing is, though, okay, so before I go into that, here's a horrible robot. <laughs> this is a horrible robot. It's half broken. It's old. It's all beat up. It's, but it's a robot that Bill had, and he took what you just saw, and put it into the first six-legged robot and had it walk. It's six hertz bandwidth. That's why the legs are shaky. Some of the motors are broken. But the point is, he took that that came right out of stick insect neurobiology, and he put it into this little, uh, silly little microcontrollers, put on this robot, and actually had it walk. It's the first time that was done. Since then, there's a wonderful robot the Germans built that uh, uses these mecha these, uh, neuro this neurobiological idea. So, okay, so what you saw was a finite state implementation of that neuro neurobiology. It can get stuck. You need something to fix that. Transitions can actually cause strange behaviors. When you change from forward to turning, for example, you actually can get strange behaviors, or it can actu actually get stuck also. You need a continuous system. You, you need actual CPGs, as you see in the animal nervous system. CPGs independent of sensory information, tend to cycle. So without any, without any sensory information, you can cycle a joint. So we want that. So we want a biological neural network, and that's what we're developing. So here is the biological, uh, a, what I call a biological neural network. What I mean by that is these are not simple, the old-fashioned neural network. This, this actually, each, each of these neurons have their own dynamics. They're simple based on the biology, but they're like integrating fire, typically. So this is for just the middle leg. Each leg, each joint, there's one, here's a pattern generator, the red, okay, here we go. These four is a pattern generator for one joint. Here's another one for another joint, here's for another joint, here's for another joint, and here's for the fifth joint, all for this middle leg. Down here you see uh, muscle control structures, uh, including uh, sensors, and up here there's inner neurons, that do the filtering of the data before it goes off to uh, the pattern generators. The green 
there's five, there's two over here, there's three over here, there's five green neurons. Those are the neurons that when they're activated in a certain way, you get different behaviors. So those two causes, cause forward walking. You activate those two, you get forward walking. You activate these two, you get inside turning. You activate those two, you get outside turning. You activate those three, you get standing, your stance there. So with very little information coming from, this, from the brain, you can get these very different behaviors. And that we know is true. We don't know exactly, it's exactly like this. Most of these pathways we do know from the neurobiology. Others we had to make up based on what's the current thinking. Okay, does it work? Well, of course it works, otherwise I wouldn't be telling you. Here's a simulation. Here's a, that middle leg forward walking, and then all of a sudden he's going to change, just excite different of those green neurons, and it's gonna change the inside turn. There's inside turn. And then if he changes it again to something else, it'll go back. I think it just goes back to forward turning, forward walking, I mean. And then it'll change it again to other things. But the bottom line is, it works much better than the finite state implementation. It doesn't get stuck. That's for one leg. You had to make six of those. All those neurons you saw there was for one leg. You had to make six of those, one for each of the six legs of the, of the animal. You then have to coordinate them. And that's what this depicts. How do you coordinate them? Well, here's the idea. Here's what the biologists tell us. One joint, CPG, in each leg influences that same CPG in adjacent legs. So you have legs connected to each other, but just barely, just through one joint. And again, the green, first off, this blue one tells you wave gate versus tripod gate. And then there's a walk, and they're just turning. Uh, the, again, the green ones cause changes in behavior. So here's walk and a wave gate. Here's walk and a tripod gate. Here's walk and a wave gate and turn right, because uh, this one down here is now excited. And then here's turning left, because this one's excited. And here you see um, the simulated cockroach walking forward. And then it's going to turn. Notice it's at... Uh, 20% uh, the actual speed. If, it, you show, if you saw it at real speed, it's hard to see anything. Just like the animal. And this is a dynamic simulation. This is actually everything had mass and inertia and all that. And uh, now we're going to switch to turn right, and it turns right. It doesn't turn right really well. We have to work on this. It's sort of crabbing sideways a bit, but it works. All right. What about mammals? Turns out that mammals have, have similar neural organizations. That surprised me, but it turns out that the, the, the best neuroscientists that know about these things tell me it's true. Kira Pierce and Ansgar Bushes tell me this is true. Similar organization. So why not take the insect data and try it out on a mammal? Well, here's a mammal. Here's a rat. Martin Fisher, University of Vienna, we're working with him. Here's a rat. High-speed x-ray video while recording from as many as 24 uh, EMG channels. 24 muscles. That's pretty impressive. High speed 3D x-ray video. I, I mean, that right there, I thought that was fantastic. Okay, here is the animal is going to put its foot in a hole right there. So he has these setups, treadmill setups, and here's one with the trap door. So the whole idea is record from muscles while this is happening and get some idea of, of how this is working. People have been doing this for years, but the technology today is so much better uh, we think we can get somewhere. So we tried this. We took the insect network and we modified it based on what's known about mammals. And there you see in the upper right hand side, there's a rat walking uh, using this uh, network. Inter interesting pixelation. Oh well. Okay. I blame Microsoft. So what should come up here, darn it, oh well, I give up. So here's the idea, from biology, modeling, reduction in complexity, uh, abstractions, uh, testing with robot legs, how do you simulate those neurons? If you use a, uh, try to put a, you essentially need a supercomputer on the robot to run it, or an FPGA. FPGAs are really great for massive parallelization so you can actually do the neural simulation. And then you can put on 
uh, a robot with artificial muscles. That's the plan. Autonomy. Well, I'm just going to go this, through this quickly. Uh, we, this is fantastic. This is a phone attack, cricket phone attacks circuit on a robot um, from years ago. This you saw on the, uh, the initial uh, slide. Uh, this is an autonomous WEGS robot with tactile antennae behaving the same way as the cockroach. Based on its antennal behavior, based on its antennal contact, it does different behaviors. So uh, here's another experiment we do with cockroaches, and I'll just go through this. And we also have a robot, and here you see the robot on the left, cockroach on the right. There's a, a dark place that the animal and the cockroach and the robot both want to go to. So they are good at wall following and seeking dark places, and that's what you see here. Here we go. Here goes the cockroach heading right for it now. The, the robot won, of course. <laughs> and, and we joke about that, but there's a reason for that, and that's because the cockroach has more things on its mind, has other things it's thinking about. The, co the robot was very simple. It said, follow the wall, head for the dark place. Okay, so we also have this deterministic model, a uh, lot of data put into this, uh, this uh, I'm sorry, um, stochastic model. Uh, lots of data going into something we call Rambler. Um, don't have time to go into it, I guess. I'm just going to skip over that. I'm also going to skip over this. Uh, this, fan this anyway, I, if you're interested, I could tell you about this. Um, re think recording from the brain of the animal. Roy Ritzman's group is now recording from the brain of the cockroach. Probes in the brain, and he's actually getting, starting to make maps of, of what parts of the brain responds to what. They found essentially something as a gas pedal in this situation. If you excite it, the animal goes faster. Or you could just wait while you're recording, and you find out that when that gets excited um, inherently, you know, you don't excite it, the, the animal thinks, I want to go faster. You see excitation, and then the animal goes faster. So we did the urban challenge. Uh, the only thing about that that's biologically inspired is that the basic architecture of the system is, is based on what you find in animals. We're doing a robot mower, and here it comes. There we go. Um, so yeah. We're doing this with Cup Cadet. Uh, the company builds Cup Cadet, and the idea is to actually build a commercial mower. And we've been doing this for five years. We, we won the contest that they have um, three out of the five years. And here you see um, doing basic things. It's uh, so yay. All right. The last thing I want to point out is working with a group at the VA. This is Ron Triolo's group. And helping paraplegics to walk. This is something Howard Chiswick worked on at, at, at Case all those years ago, and he'll, I'm going to have to talk to him about it later. But this is just using a, a bracing. This is bracing only. There's a kinematic mechanism right here. This is a commercially available. And that kinematic mechanism right there that, 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 that makes the, the hips move opposite each other, makes them alternate. And that helps the person to get a gait, even though they're, they're paralyzed from the waist down. So another way you can do it is functional electrical stimulation. And things haven't changed at all, in my opinion, since you were there. <laughs> OK. So they have gotten better in terms of number of channels. Some things have gotten better. I, I, I shouldn't have said that, because some, some things have gotten better. But there's a lot of things that could be improved. But you see the walking isn't, isn't real natural. OK, so why not combine bracing and FES? That's the idea. There's problems with the bracing. There's problem with the FES. Rapid muscle fatigue. You just can't go long at all with the FES. Uh, if you put the two together, and call it a hybrid system. In theory, you get rid of all the problems, and you have this fantastic system. This is hydraulic. This is Curtis Toe. You should hire him, by the way. Um, he, he developed this, this hydraulic system that it's really great because you can couple you can variably couple, and you can lock uh, uh, various joints. And here you see what I think is much more normal walking. Much more normal walking in my mind. What's wrong with it is it's really big and heavy. But we've already reduced the structural weight by 50%. Um, the, we used 
We use standard hydraulics. We need to ha customize hydraulics. That's something we're working on now. We can get the weight down. We can, we can make it compact. It's going to be, I think, the way to go. Here's Nicole Kern again. Uh, something else you need is a back brace. So, you can, so if, you're, if you're trying to walk around with any of these mechanisms, you need a back brace that keeps your waist stiff since you have no control over it. Well, it would be nice to be able to sit down. <laughs> if you have this stiff thing, it's hard to sit down and be comfortable. Well, with this, with one motor here, you can pull on, on this tendon, and this is essentially a spine-like structure. They, they compact, it's stiff. You let it go, it's compliant. So it's switchably compliant back brace. We have also done an ankle orthosis. I'll skip that. All right. And of course, my last slide, we have a new strategy about way get, ways of getting funding. And uh, my buccaneers will be here in a moment. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. I think we have time for a couple of questions. I thought I did it perfectly, so there'd be no yeah. questions whatsoever. No, 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 no. We'll, we'll squeeze a question in. Anyone have a burning question? Josh? Can be used for you know cars or you know vehicles. Any reason why not or why? I didn't show a video of uh, the um, what it looks like. Uh, like put a camera on the on the on the robot was running around. And of course, you get this motion, which is not unusual for even a legged robot, right? And two things about that. One is that who cares? It, this this happens if you're running around on a smooth terrain. This robot's not meant for smooth terrain. So if the, ro if, the, if the terrain is like this, who cares about it? You know, I mean, in fact, it's probably smoother than if you had wheels, right? In fact, wheels can't go anywhere anyway, so who cares? The other thing is uh, uh, a uh, collaborated Air Force Institute of Technology took this robot and uh, just put a software uh, isolation on it, and that camera was dead straight. Now, if you go to a bigger robot, put wheel legs on it, you got all kinds of problems. You've got to put a suspension on it because you'll break everything possible. People have done this. I, I'm, you may have seen, uh, I think it was Junkyard Wars or something. Somebody actually built a car with wheel legs, and it was, it was terrifying. <laughs> Maybe another question? No? Everybody's got to run to class. So yes. uh, thank you again. Mm -hmm.